4G and I can see the people in the spot right over there. <laughs> yes, Steve. <laughs> to introduce Dr. Jenny Tung. Um, on behalf of all the MBZ graduate students, as Jenny is the MBZ student advisor speaker for the spring semester, um, we graduate students think that Jenny is one of the leading um, experts in the field of evolutionary biology trying to understand or dissect the genomic signatures of social behavior in various mammals such as baboons and macaques. Um, and in particular, a large portion of her, of her lab is looking at these wild populations of baboons um, in Kenya and trying to make the connection between social status and patterns across the genome of DNA methylation and gene expression and also the effects of the immune system level. Um, but not only has she done phenomenal work um, on that aspect of her research in her lab, but her lab has also developed um, methods of trying to sequence whole genomes from non-invasive DNA. So DNA collected from fecal samples and other non-invasive tissues. So really phenomenal work, um, and we're really excited um, to have her speak. And in fact, Jenny has some uh, connections with the MBZ. Um, in fact, she almost did her PhD here with Eileen Lacey here in the MBZ, but apparently did not like the California weather too much. So <laughs> <laughs> she went to get her PhD at Duke University um, in 2010, and then did a postdoc at the University of Chicago for a couple years, and then in 2012 uh, went back to Duke and has been now, is now an associate professor. Um, and so, although she wasn't physically here, she still has some connections currently with the department and the MBZ. In fact, um, one of her undergraduate students, um, Rena Debray, is now a first year graduate student here in Britt Cascella's lab. And then Mike Yuan, I think I said his name correctly, um, is actually a PhD student in Ian Wong's lab here in the MBZ. So another connection is Dana Lin, one of her own MBZ graduate students, um, just completed her PhD this last summer and is now a postdoc in Jenny Tung's lab. So even though you didn't physically come here, we still feel your connections here in the museum and the department. So like I said, us graduate students are really excited for you to, uh, to be here, and thank you for coming. And we're really excited to hear more about your evolutionary and gene regulation consequences of all the Thanks very much, Mallory. It's always a real honor to be invited by, by graduate students, and, and um, you know, since it sends this message that your work might be relevant to people who are really thinking about the next generation of science. So uh, thanks a lot for allowing me to come visit this beautiful part of the world and this beautiful campus. Um, I don't know if you know, but there's a polar vortex going on on the East Coast. It was a great time to be out here. And I had some really fun meetings this morning, and I look forward to meeting more of you um, this afternoon. So um, I'll go ahead and start by introducing one of my main study systems. Uh, these are wild yellow baboons in the Amboseli ecosystem of Kenya. So it's right on the border between uh, Kenya to the north and Tanzania to the south. Um, I like to show this picture uh, not only because it is aesthetically beautiful, but because I think it does a good job of giving you a sense of the ecological context in which these animals live their lives. So up in this foreground, that's an acacia tree. Those are the same... Um, uh, species that are in the background there. Acacia trees are important for baboons because they use them as sleeping sites every night to get away from predators. They also rely on, uh, on acacia gum and acacia pods um, as an important part of their diet. Uh, this is the dry season and so the baboons are foraging in this grassland savanna. Um, a big part of their diet during, during this part of the year are actually the underground um, uh, grass corms. So they spend a lot of time scratching in the dirt trying to um, extract these very low nutrient quality resources. And uh, you don't see them here, but you can imagine in this kind of environment, there's, there's actually a full complement of predators and prey that these animals interact with. So there are zebras and wildebeest and gazelles and hares and vervet monkeys, so some things that the animals prey on, and also uh, leopards and lions and hyenas, things that are predators on the bedroom themselves. So um, that's what you see here. What this picture maybe doesn't capture so well, though, is what we tend to think of as some of the most salient parts of the environment that these animals experience day to day. What makes a baboon's day a good day or a bad day? And that largely has to do with their interactions with each other. That's also very true, I think, in large part for, for humans. Right? And so maternal-infant relationships 
agonistic relationships, like uh, you see here among these males who are kind of having a, a conversation with each other non-verbally about who's on top, and affiliative relationships, which are largely cemented by grooming, um, as you see on the right, those are the things um, that we think uh, might have some of the most important impacts on differences in lifetime reproductive success, differences in survival, and differences in fertility um, in a population like this, an obligately social uh, mammal like baboons. Um, just to pull it back to our own species, this, this also is true for humans. And in fact, some of the best evidence that social relationships are important for uh, health and survival come from human populations where this kind of relationship has been studied um, for over 100 years, largely in social sciences. So let me just give you uh, an idea of what I mean here. So this is redrawn from a meta-analysis published some years ago now that was interested in quantifying the predictive effects of social relationships, social integration, and social support on all cause mortality in adult people. Um, basically, the further the bar is to the right, the bigger of an effect the predictor on the left has on the probability of death at any given age uh, in both uh, men and women, and all, all individuals who are healthy when um, they, they were included in the study. This is about 150 studies worth of data summarized. And what it tells us is that aspects of, of affiliative social relationships have as big or potentially larger predictive effects on mortality as other kind of env environmental factors that you're more likely to be asked about at the doctor, or more likely to see public service announcements about um, smoking behavior, uh, alcoholism, so this is abstinence versus six or more alcoholic drinks a day. You can put it up here, but that's also true relative to obesity, um, history of exercise, past history of cardiovascular disease, and so on. So there's a really big predictive effect. Um, you see the same sort of thing when you measure <laughs> aspects of competitive social relationships in humans. This is a really <laughs> remarkable um, uh, data set published in JAMA a few years ago on uh, socioeconomic status measured in this case by um, household income at age 40 and projections on, on lifespan in uh, the United States. Um, what you uh, uh, may not know about this data set, if you haven't seen it talked about before, is that some of you guys are probably in it. So this is a data set that encompasses 1.4 billion person years of data, right? This is big data. And the reason it has so much data in it is because anybody who is age 40 or above in between the years 1999 and 2014, in the United States, if you filed taxes, you didn't have to pay taxes, you had to file taxes, then you're in this data set. Okay? And what it tells us is by, uh, by percentile, what the expected age of death is for people who reach 40 within that time window. So you can sort of take a closer look and figure out where you are and how you're going to spend the rest of the day. Right? And so one of the really striking things about this is is not only that there's a big difference in lifespan between women and men, which we knew about, that generalizes across a lot of, of uh, other mammalian species, but that, that there's a strong <laughs> gradient in expected lifespan. It's not just material deprivation versus relative wealth. Actually, as you tick down every percentile, there is um, a slight decrement in expected lifespan. So a lot of data on this coming out of um, the social sciences and social epidemiology. So this is like nicely summarized by um, a social epidemiologist who worked back in the 70s, um, in part at UNC in part in South Africa, where he said, well, you know, we're used to thinking about environmental stressors as things like, you know, poor nutrition or fatigue or overwork, you know, physical insults to our body. I would suggest that there's another category of environmental factor, uh, factors that are potentially just as important and emphasis added by me, that is the presence of other members of the same species, or more generally, certain aspects of the social environment. I particularly like, because he spent his whole career studying humans, that he actually talked about as other members of the same species, as conspecies <laughs> in general, and not just focused on, on humans. So another way to think about this is from um, Jean-Paul Sartre, and his, uh, his type of website, where he said, hell, hell is other people, right? Or conversely, heaven can be other people. And perhaps for other social <coughs> animals, um, hell is other baboons, or hell is other uh, rock hyraxes, or hell is other uh, bottlenose dolphins. And in fact, I think there is emergent evidence for this. Um, this is from our scraping of all the studies that we could find that looked at wild populations and aspects of social integration or social affiliation and natural mortality rates in unmanipulated populations um, across mammals specifically, sorry. Uh, and what you see is an overall pattern that is very consistent with the one in, in humans, or 
somewhat smaller sample sizes in other natural populations, where individuals who are more socially <coughs> integrated or have uh, greater social support measured in a variety of ways tend to have longer natural lifespans. The only exception to that that we are aware of in the literature so far, please let me know if you know something else, is in yellow-bellied marmots from Dan Blumstein's population in the Rockies. So this appears to be fairly <coughs> generalizable as a phenomenon across social mammals, suggesting that we can look to other species as models to understand human health, if you're interested in questions like that, and that we need to look very, very closely at social relationships if we want to understand differences in fitness in animals that we might be uh, interested in studying who do uh, live in these sort of obligately social uh, relationships. Um, so, I've drawn this relationship between social interactions, either competitive or affiliative, and fitness-related and health outcomes uh, on the other hand, right? Survival is a huge part of fitness, and in fact, in long-lived species tends to be a more important predictor of lifetime reproductive uh, success than, than fertility in any given year. So one possibility is that there's a direct relationship between the two. Um, this is a model that my social science colleagues would call social causation. Right? So social adversity per se influences these kinds of outcomes. Um, uh, based on my example so far, you might have thought about other ways that you could draw arrows between these, these, two, um, these two boxes. One, of course, is, is mediation, the possibility that social adversity predicts other aspects of the environment in humans, for example, a fairly salient one would be poor access to health care or smoking behavior or differences in diet. And it's these things that are, in fact, are causal to um, fitness and health-related outcomes. So that's certainly a possibility. And another possibility is that we're seeing a lot of reverse causation. That in fact, um, individuals who are in poorer health to begin with are less able to maintain social relationships with one another or less able to compete in whichever way um, that particular species does for higher social status. And in fact, it's been very difficult to disentangle these potential relationships um, in those massive studies of humans. That leaves a lot of open questions about when social relationships might be most important to particular types of outcomes, why, from the perspective of um, evolutionary theory, this might happen to begin with, what the actual mechanisms might be that link you know, how we interact with each other in this sort of social aggregation with uh, outcomes that are demonstrably physical, and who might be most affected by this kind of relationship. You know, what explains heterogeneity in vulnerability to or resilience to uh, social interactions? Okay. So to address these questions, uh, we study social mammals of a variety of, um, of types. I've spent most of um, my career so far focused on non-human primates, although increasingly we're starting to look at some other systems like these cool social carnivores, <coughs> meerkats in South Africa, and the, the species on the right, which is the Damarland mole rat, the less famous cousin of naked mole rats. Um, so we study them in both the wild and in captivity for two reasons. By looking at natural populations where we can get an entire life course perspective on who survives and who doesn't, who has kids and who doesn't, then we can ask about fitness consequences uh, and evolutionary history. By studying these two species on the right, which we work with in captivity, we can do experimental manipulations of the social environment in order to ask questions about causality and molecular mechanism. I'll focus on the, on the primates here, um, but I'm very excited about the work that we're doing on these species on the bottom. I'm happy to talk about it uh, with anybody who's interested. Okay. So I'll start with baboons, who I already introduced uh, in that first slide. Um, part of the reason I study baboons is because there's a real, ex really extraordinary data set, long-term data set, on uh, wild baboons. And that is based on the long-term efforts of the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project, which has now been ongoing since 1971. This is a longitudinal study, and in this case, what I mean by that is that known individuals in this population, <coughs> recognized on site the way that I would recognize Michael or Mallory, um, have been followed on a near daily basis, so every day basically other than Sundays, um, since 1971. So we are now in our 48th year of continuous data collection. That means that we're actually watching uh, individuals who are part of a known pedigree for up to about eight generations now. And we collect complementary information on their demography, on their life history, <coughs> on their social behaviors, and more recently over time we've added dimensions that uh, focus on um, endocrinology, uh, genetics, and uh, the microbiome. So I'm lucky enough to work with this uh, project through the long-term foresight of Gene Altman, who founded uh, the project, and Susan Alberts, who's been directing the project since the late 90s. Beth Archie, who's at the University of Notre Dame, and I are now associate directors. Uh, I didn't update this, but we're just around 2,000 
known individuals now for this population. So um, interest in the predictors of physiology and fitness have has, has been you know, long-standing in this population. And over time, we've identified a number of factors that, if they affect baboons early in their lives, have quants of consequences for later life phenotypes. And I've drawn a few of these relationships um, uh, up on, on the board. We know that there are relationships between early life social status and later life physiological and life history outcomes. We know that mothers are very important, um, that their presence is very important through the first few years of life, as well as their integration with other individuals in the social group. We know that resource competition and variation um, in the abiotic environment, particularly the amount of rainfall year to year, are also quite important to predicting things later in life. What we hadn't done until a few years ago was put these predictors together to ask about whether cumulative exposure to adversity has um, detectable effects on lifelong outcomes. And we decided to do this based uh, largely on, on, again, studies by social scientists where they do something very simple, which is to simply add up the number of insults that occur to, in this case, uh, humans early in life and ask about their predictive effects on lifespan. So we tried that out. Uh, focusing on six major sources of early adversity in this wild baboon population. One is early life social status, so the dominance rank of a baby's mother uh, when she was born. This focuses specifically on females, where we have the best lifelong data. Uh, whether that female had her mother around throughout her entire <coughs> infancy and juvenile period, so that's up to about age four in this population. How socially integrated uh, that mom was uh, with other females in her group. Whether she had another baby after a short uh, interbirth interval, so this is uh, having a competing younger sibling within one and a half years of um, a focal individual's birth. Um, that's fairly rapid for a <coughs> baboon. Um, resource competition, so did this baboon live in a high density <coughs> environment in which there were all, a lot of other mouths to feed and foraging in the same area? <coughs> and then of course this crucial uh, abiotic variable, which uh, is drought. So in dry years, um, this ecosystem is, I guess, about the amount of rainfall that you would expect um, in, in uh, Tempe, Arizona. All right, this is how those sources of adversity pan out um, in baboons in Amboseli. So about a third of them experience uh, one source of early, one of these six sources of early adversity, and another quarter ex uh, experience two. A small number of them get hit repeatedly by multiple early life insults. And then there's this 20% um, are sort of silver spoon babies who um, <laughs> never experience any of these things. Okay? So uh, we didn't know what this would look like, but this became one of those analyses where you do it and you go, we probably did not need statistics to see this. Um, so here we're looking at adult survival in baboons stratified by the number of adverse early events they experienced, okay? And it splits out beautifully. So there, those are silver, silver spoon kids, right, in the dark blue, and they live the longest. And then there's this gradient effect, again, the number of insults that very clearly predicts adult lifespan, right? This is not early life adversity where, where something bad happens and their lives are immediately compromised. These are, these are things um, that manifest later in life. And so what we see is a difference in lifespan um, that is on the scale of years. So if a female baboon who didn't experience um, much adversity in early life makes it to reproductive adulthood, makes it to age four, which is about when menarche occurs, then her expected lifespan is about 18 or 19 years, pretty long. If she experienced three sources of early adversity, then her expected lifespan is nine years. So this is a 10 year difference in expected lifespan. Um, for those of you who don't think about baboons but are familiar with human lifespans, um, you know how like dog years, or, like, one dog year is seven human years? The approximate scaling factor for baboons is about three to four years. So if we saw this kind of effect in humans, we're talking about a difference of 30 years or so a more of expected lifespan. And again, just to give you a framework for thinking about that kind of number, the estimates of, um, of lifespan increase if we were to snap our fingers and like get rid of all cancer, all cancer deaths gone, um, is a difference of about three years of expected lifespan. Interestingly, um, one of the potential mediators of this effect is actually social integration. So females who were uh, exposed to less adversity early in life grow up to have stronger social relationships with other females. 
does this matter in terms of lifetime reproductive success? Well, I've shown you this matters to the females themselves, right? They die early. <coughs> it turns out, as I alluded to earlier, that how long you live as a long-lived um, primate in this environment is by far the best predictor of how many surviving offspring. These are surviving offspring to one year of age. Um, it's, it's an almost perfect linear relationship where the longer you live, the more babies you have, um, and a female baboon produces another kid, another surviving offspring, approximately every 2.1 years. So this has rather large ramifications for fitness. Um, one of Susan Albert's graduate students, Matthew Zippel, has uh, started asking um, how long of a shadow these sort of early life events might have on um, the lineage of these animals. Uh, so intergenerational consequences of adversity, focusing specifically on maternal loss and competing younger siblings, which were actually the strongest effects in our earlier composite model. And what he's shown quite strikingly, okay, so here we have females who experience maternal loss, females who experience competing younger siblings, when they were babies, they grow up and they have kids. And so what these survival plots are showing you is um, the effect of the mom's early life experience on the survival of their offspring much later in life. And what it shows is that females who themselves lost their moms, those are in red here, have a much lower likelihood of having their kids survive when they become adults. And that's true for competing younger siblings as well. Okay? So this is an event that may have happened 20 years ago that still has an effect on juvenile survival. <coughs> Um, these effects are completely independent of the offspring's own environment, and we think, well at least their own environment as measured through these same variables, and we think are probably explained by just generally reduced maternal viability um, later in life. And the reason we think so is because if we ask about offspring survival in the first two years of life, for females who are affected by those two crucial early life adverse events, um, we see that kids whose moms will die in years two to four of their lives, or what would be years two to four of their lives, actually have a lower probability of survival. So it looks like those moms are actually just in some sort of poorer health in general when they have these, these um, third generation kids. Okay. So uh, this is work that suggests to us that like humans and mice, where critical periods have been extensively um, Characterized. Early life in these wild baboons is a very important period that affects lifelong survival far after those windows of early life are over, and that most of the most important predictors of, um, of early life uh, effects on later life are related to social resources, especially the importance of mothers. We think that multiple hits actually can bound to increase risk over and above individual effects, and we have these initial um, suggestions that these consequences can, can persist for much longer to affect you know, the spread of a lineage and not just an individual generation. Okay. So to go back to this kind of potential model of pathways that link um, uh, social lives to health or fitness outcomes, um, what I've been telling you so far is about a natural population, and so that gives us you know, stronger reason to believe this is truly evolutionarily important. But um, it's not very good at parsing causal arrows, right? Because we can't actually do a manipulation of early life adversity and ask how that affects these animals downstream. Reverse causal relationships are still possible. And so that's one of the reasons that we also spend a lot of time working, as I mentioned earlier, with captive animals in which more control is possible. So for the last 10 years or so, I've been working on these guys. These are rhesus macaques. Um, about six to eight million years diverged from baboons, also highly obligately social primates um, who form strong uh, dominance rank hierarchies and also uh, individually differentiated social relationships. And I've been working on these guys um, in collaboration with Mark Wilson and, and Vasiliki Mishopoulos, who are at Emory University, and Luis Barrero, who's uh, now at the University of Montreal. The reason we work with them is because they're very large colonies of rhesus macaques in captivity. They are um, a, a major biomedical model. And because it's possible for us to manipulate the dominance rank hierarchies of these animals in, in adulthood. And the reason this works um, quite remarkably to me, it was quite remarkable when I found out about this, is that if you take adult <coughs> rhesus macaques um, and you introduce them into new social groups, you can manipulate their order of introduction into these groups. And it turns out that individuals who enter new social groups earlier 
become high ranking. Okay? And so you can do an experimental randomization that lets you largely, not perfectly, but largely control the dominance ranks of the individuals in your sample. Um, we make five individual social groups, and we can replicate those social groups. So we can ask about what's going on in nine or ten different social groups running at the same time. Um, in uh, 2012 or so, when we started the, the last <coughs> round of this kind of manipulation, we were really interested in trying to pin down causal effects. And so we decided that in addition to this initial manipulation, we should do a secondary manipulation um, where we kept those animals in the same kind of demographic environment, but switched around their dominance ranks in the middle of the study. So we could do this, and we actually followed groups like this for about a year. And then we did a secondary manipulation where we formed new social groups com composed of the same individuals, but put all the alpha females together in one group, and all of the beta females together in one group, and so on. What this leads to is a reassortment of the hierarchy. These are highly hierarchical animals, and they form new social hierarchies. You know, Probably they know within the matter of days, it takes us a few weeks to collect enough behavioral data to pick it up. But what this does is maximizes possible transitions um, across, across this manipulation. So you see the same animals potentially when they're high rank and low rank, low rank and high rank, and some of them don't change very much. Um, the way this study worked is we, we watched each phase of the study for, for about a year, collecting various types of data. Um, so this uh, graphic just gives you an idea of what that looks like. So this is one of our groups formed in 2013 now. That's been a while ago. Um, each uh, line is a different female in the group, and they're being introduced in this group one by one. The x-axis is going to show you time. The y-axis is an index of rank. In this particular study, we used a ranking measure called an ELO ranking. Some of you might be familiar with that. Anybody? Yeah? Right. So some of you might be familiar with it because you study animal behavior. Um, of course, th this is actually the ranking that's used for chess players, uh, tennis players, and badminton players, and I'm told World of Warcraft players also <laughs> use ELO. Um, so it's updated every time there's a, a behavioral interaction where you can clearly score a winner and a loser. So these are animals going in. They start off at the same value and they very rapidly segregate into a ladder-like linear dominance rank hierarchy, which then remains stable, which is a characteristic of female <coughs> cat hierarchies over time. Okay. We've used this paradigm to ask a, a number of questions now, starting with whole organism level measurements of behavior, and it turns out that your social status, perhaps unsurprisingly to us as social primates, influences your behavior. Um, we've asked how this uh, affects physiology by looking particularly at um, aspects of uh, HPA axis function. We've gone a little bit deeper to ask about the composition of cells. This is actually work that was led by Rena, who's standing here in the back. Um, we see relationships between aspects of social behavior in this study system and mitochondrial DNA copy number. And then we've gone within cells to ask about whether gene regulation in a cell type specific manner is influenced by dominance rank. Um, just recently, at the end of last year, we published a paper showing that dominance rank, so how your interactions proceed, or how these animals' interactions proceed with other, other uh, conspecifics, also affects the 3D configuration of the genome, so the actual accessibility of DNA to regulation by transcription factors. Um, again, I'm really happy to talk about any of these sorts of studies if people are interested. I'm just going to tell you one story here focused on um, measures that are perhaps most directly relevant to um, you know, survival and health-related outcomes, which is the response to um, a challenge by bacteria. Okay. Um, this is work that was led by my former postdoc, Noah Snyder Mackler, who's now um, at University of Washington in his own job, and uh, my colleague Luis's uh, postdoc, Joaquin Sanz. So, um, we didn't want to perturb the animals themselves, so the way that we did this sort of challenge was actually just to draw blood from our animals into one of two tubes, one which contained only cell culture media, so sufficient food for the cells for them to survive for some time ex vivo. And we paired that with a second drop into the same type of tube that contained media spiked with lipopolysaccharide, which is a component of the gram-negative bacterial cell wall, and induces a very, very strong um, uh, innate immune response in, in blood cells. And it would do the same thing to, to any of us. Uh, LPS is one of the compounds uh, involved in septic shock. We then kept these at 37 degrees, so just an ex vivo, you know, 
incubator version of a macaque for four hours. And then we purified uh, the white blood cells from each of these samples, paired samples from each of our individuals, and um, put them through RNA sequencing. So I'm going to jump to some of the results here. So this is a summary of our data. This is 45 females in nine different social groups um, with paired samples. So each female is represented by two dots, one control, one LPS stimulated. And this is uh, focused on about 9,000 different genes that we measured in those samples. Okay, so this is just a PCA decomposition of the major sources of variance in the, those gene expression data. And what you can see immediately is that the first PC clearly separates out animals who were samples that did not see LPS from samples that did see LPS. And that's exactly what we should expect. Your immune cells should respond to a major stimulus of, um, uh, that looks like bacterial infection. What was really striking to us, though, is that the second principal component there is very strongly correlated with dominance rank. So in these figures, darker colors are higher ranking individuals, and lighter <coughs> colors are lower ranking individuals. Okay, so it looks like there's a fairly global signature of uh, dominance rank on this aspect, this measure of the immune response. So I was showing you a sample level view on the previous slide. Here I'm transitioning to a gene level view. Remember, we measured about 9,000 genes in the genome. So each dot here is a different gene, and what I'm plotting here is the effect of dominance rank, social status, on gene expression for that gene in the control, in the negative control condition, versus the dominance rank effect after um, a paired sample saw LPS, right, saw so <coughs> bacterial infection. And overall, it's, it's a positive correlation. So genes that are more highly expressed by high-ranking individuals in a baseline state are also more highly expressed by high-ranking individuals in um, a state that simulates bacterial infection. Um, the, the sort of uh, violation of that overall rule is in this cloud of points down here. And what uh, points in this part of the chart represent are cases where low-ranking individuals had a stronger response to infection than high-ranking individuals. Okay? And you can kind of see that here. This is the distribution of the absolute effect of LPS on gene expression for animals of low rank versus high rank. And in fact, if you squint, you can kind of see that in the PCA plot, too, where the low-ranking individuals who are low on that y-axis seem to separate more than the high-ranking individuals who are high on that y-axis. Okay, so what's going on here? I know some of you guys do genomic analyses, and so you're all quite uh, aware of the fact that if you look at enough genes, you can show examples of any pattern you want. <laughs> and, and we can do that too, right? So there are genes that are upregulated by LPS, and then there are genes that are downregulated by LPS, and there are genes that are more highly expressed in high-ranking individuals and genes that are more highly expressed in low-ranking individuals. And here are examples of all of them, and we have them all. Okay? So it's hard to make some sense of this, I think, um, at face value. Uh, so we asked whether there are any sort of coherent biological signatures in genes that fell in any of those categories. So we basically did some gene set enrichment approaches, which often aren't very informative, but in this case we think actually helped us out a lot. So if we asked about coherent biological pathways that tend to be overrepresented in each of those categories, the bottom two categories just fall out. And what we get are enrichments specifically in, in this category, uh, genes that were upregulated by infection and um, uh, more so in, in low-ranking individuals, uh, and the, the opposite genes that are upregulated uh, in, in an infection uh, state but um, were highly expressed in high-ranking individuals. And what's interesting about this is that we get a lot of um, categories that have to do with infl inflammatory responses on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we get very specifically one type of, 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 of gene set, and that's, those are genes involved in type 1 interferon signaling. So also, innate immune response is often actually more closely associated with viral uh, stimulation and bacterial stimulation. Um, so my collaborator, Luis, is an immunogenomics guy, and he was like, this is so interesting. And I was like, great, it's really interesting. Why is it interesting? Um, and he, here's why it's interesting. Um, you learn a lot by working with people across fields. So the, um, the receptor for lipopolysaccharide, the compound that we used, is um, a cell surface receptor called toll-like receptor 4. Um, and toll-like receptor 4 signals intracellularly uh, 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 via two different pathways. This left-hand branch, this MyD88-dependent pathway, and this right-hand branch, this TRIF-dependent pathway. And I've colored in genes that are in those low-rank and high-rank <coughs> categories in, in blue and purple, respectively. There are a lot of them involved in both of these pathways, which end 
interestingly, in these genes down at the bottom, these are all transcription factors that interact directly with DNA to mount a, a transcriptional regulatory program downstream of the detection of LPS. Okay? And it looks like genes involved in, in low rank, <coughs> or highly expressed in low ranking individuals, are more clustered on the left hand side, and vice versa for genes that are more highly expressed in high ranking individuals. Okay, so that suggests that the transcriptional programs um, invoked by LPS stimulation differ depending on social status. And to ask that question in more detail, we turned to a high throughput assay um, that allows us to measure chromatin accessibility. Again, um, the sort of three dimensional um, folding of, of the genome. So uh, most of our DNA, as you guys all know, is in this sort of closed chromatin state because there's no way that we can fit um, you know, two meters of DNA into the space of a nucleus without tight packaging. But closed chromatin regions tend to be um, uh, non-active. Uh, they're, not, they're not actively being regulated. Regions of open chromatin, where those, um, where those histones uh, uh, unfold, where the nucleosomes unfold, those are regions of the genome that we think are regulatory active. And we can um, use little molecular scissors to clip out regions of open chromatin specifically, add adapter to them, push them through aluminum sequencing in a, in a uh, technique called attack seq, map them to the genome, and then ask, okay, those regions that are accessible, what kind of transcription factors actually bind there? Right? We just do that by back inference from, from the sequence motifs themselves. Okay? So we can do that in our animals. And this is what we found. So regions of the genome that were active and regulatory that were um, specifically close to genes that were highly expressed in high-ranking individuals actually specifically contained NF-kappa B binding sequences, right? Those transcription factors downstream of that left-hand pro-inflammatory side of those pathways. Whereas uh, genes that were close to open regulatory <coughs> regions um, that were more highly expressed in high rank did exactly the opposite. They were being heavily affected by interferon regulatory factor binding. And in fact, we could turn to mouse model knockout data to push this even further. What we know from mouse models is that TRIF-dependent genes, genes where the response to LPS is specifically dependent on having this, this pathway intact, are enriched in this high rank category and not, not in the low rank category. And genes that are uh, dependent on MyD88, it's exactly the opposite, right? They're actually significantly under-enriched in this high rank category and significantly over-enriched in the low rank category. So what we think we're seeing is evidence that these kinds of interactions, right, these, these, um, the relative valence of these interactions, are they positive, are they negative, and how often are individuals actually um, being harassed by other, uh, other conspecifics living in the same social group, not only affects behavior, right, but gets into the cells in a way that changes the complement of mRNAs they produce, alters the response to infection, so alters the response to completely um, separate orthogonal stressors, and does so by actually polarizing the signaling pathways that are used in response to those stressors. So we're going from you know, very organismal level interactions to very, very fine scale changes in the response to infection. This is something um, that we're pursuing, uh, and we're continuing to pursue now by looking at um, aspects of the adaptive immunity as well and by looking at social history effects. So if you change your <coughs> social environment, how much does, uh, do these outcome variables change along with them? So um, the last thing I want to tell you about is, is bringing it back to the wild because, you know, these sort of manipulations in captivity are really helpful. They point to new kinds of um, assays we might take into natural systems but they don't tell us whether our results generalize to natural systems, at least not directly. And I had a fantastic um, graduate student, Amanda Leah, uh, who's now postdoc at Princeton, who looked at what we did in macaques and said, well, there's really no reason why we can't do this, barring the manipulation, in wild baboons in the middle of the savanna <coughs> in a tent. And I said, okay. <laughs> okay, let's try it. So this is a picture of one of the few uh, minimally invasive types of work that we do in Amicelli. This is a darting in process. So that's uh, our, our field assistant, Kenya Waratere, and he's got a blowpipe, which is about a meter long, just a hollow tube. Um, and this is a, a great picture that Jean took because there's the dart uh, on the way between his blowpipe and its target, which in this particular situation was a female named Luna. And um, this is an extremely labor-intensive, highly skilled uh, 
process, which is probably not generalizable to other other jobs. But our, our, um, our, our field team is really good at it. So we can occasionally do this and take blood samples, which means that we can actually use the same kind of tubes in the field for these animals that we know really well and um, do these paired samples where we have control samples and stimulated samples as well, null and LPS samples. That is a field incubator. It is a, it is a MacGyvered um, igloo <laughs> cooler that maintains the temperature of these samples at 37 degrees until we also can isolate uh, blood cells and, and push them through these kinds of um, functional genomic assays. Okay, so these are the macaque data I showed you already, right? Null and LPS stimulated samples from females of different rank. In the baboons, we can look at both females and males. And what we find in females is the same sort of LPS uh, separation, uh, and same thing in males. But in female baboons in the wild, there are almost no rank-associated genes, very, very few. There's a very small signature of dominance rank. In, in males, we find um, uh, two orders of magnitude more. <laughs> right? So there are very strong sex-specific um, associations with dominance rank in this species. So that was interesting. And then, of course, we wanted to know, well, what are those genes? What do they look like? And uh, we compared them to, oops, right, sorry, I should mention this too. Very similar to what I told you in the macaques, PC2 of this um, gene expression decomposition correlates with dominance, right, in, in these male baboons. <coughs> so that's cool. And then we look, okay, so what are these genes, right? And we get a lot of similar kinds of genes. We get genes involved in immune defense and particularly in inflammation in the male baboons as we did in the female macaques. And if we ask about um, those specific MyD88 and TRIF dependent pathways, we see something that looks quite similar, right? So MyD88 and in blue, TRIF dependent genes in orange over here, and the mean expression levels of those genes in the LPS positive condition. It looks like great replication, right? But here's the, here's the kicker. Um, these genes are upregulated in low ranking females. That's what I've been telling you the whole time. These genes are upregulated in high-ranking males in the baboon setting, and um, these measures of dominant rank are oppositely polarized. So these pictures look <coughs> the same because low on the x-axis is low rank in the way that we measured rank in female macaques, and it's high rank because this is an ordinal measure of rank in the baboons. So you have probably thought already that perhaps we introduced a minus one into our code somewhere. And this was our, our, our leading hypothesis for, um, for quite some time. Um, and we are quite sure that we did not accidentally multiply everything by minus one. Um, so what's going on here? Well, there's a couple possible uh, explanations. One is that, like uh, in the macaques, rank drives variation in gene expression. It just does so in a way that's, that's polarized in the opposite direction. And if so, our prediction would be that social status effects on gene expression are mediated by behavioral um, measures that are related to social status, right? This is not magical. There must be something about being high status or low status that causes this kind of effect. <coughs> if that's the case, then what we'd expect is that if we do some sort of mediation analysis or partial correlations analysis or something like that, pathway analysis, that a rank effect that we measured in our, on, in our sample, this is not real data, sorry, this is just a, a, a cartoon, would go away once we took account of the differences in what life experience looks like for high-ranking and low-ranking baboons, particularly their involvement, for example, in, in agonistic behaviors. Um, and, and in fact, to go back to macaques, that's totally what we see in the rhesus macaques. If we take into account differences in harassment and differences in grooming, that accounts for a lot of the observations that I just talked <coughs> about. So we expected potentially something similar, and we didn't see it at all. So um, this is, these are actual data. These are the rank effects not including, not accounting for rank associated behaviors. And these are the rank effects uh, accounting for dominance rank associated behaviors. And they look like exactly the same. There's very little evidence for mediation here. Another hypothesis is that differences in immune gene expression are pre predecessors to differences in rank or maintenance of dominance rank in male baboons, right? And so that's this kind of pathway where gene expression comes before dominance rank. Um, and the prediction that we could come up with in this context is that genetic effects on rank-associated gene expression, EQTL, expression QTL, um, on uh, gene expression for genes associated with rank might also predict rank. And we can use a technique called Mendelian randomization to try and get at that. So let me talk a little bit about, are, are you guys familiar with Mendelian randomization at all? Anybody? Okay. So let's talk about that briefly. Okay, 
So in um, an experiment, like this is our gold standard experiment that we all learn about, right, in fourth grade, where we put plants with rock music and plants not with rock music, and then you measure outcomes, right? you randomize those plants. Right? It's a randomized control trial. You have some sort of randomization where you have an exposed case and a control case, and there's not supposed to be anything different about who goes into the experimental and who goes in the control case, and then you compare outcomes, and, and if you have a difference, then you believe your manipulation is causal to the outcome. Mendelian randomization is an attempt to get around this with um, genetic data. And the idea is that what genotype you get um, should, if this works correctly, be random with respect to, um, to, to any, con uh, any potential confounder. And so if you have an allele that, uh, for example, increases your uh, LDL you know, like, right, um, versus decreases your LDL, then you've got randomization of individuals into a high LDL or a low LDL. Here I'm just talking about cholesterol. Um, and then you can ask whether those alleles, that genotype, in fact, predicts heart disease, right? And if it does, then it's evidence that LDL is a predecessor to, to, to uh, heart disease. So this is just a generalization of the idea of instrumental variable analysis, where you have two variables, A and B, and you want to know, does A <coughs> predict B? Is A causal to B? And you have this other third variable, your instrument, in this case, your genotype, okay? To do this, it requires uh, some some demonstration that you haven't violated any major assumptions. One is that variable C and variable A are correlated, right? That's easy to show statistically, and that there's no evidence for reverse causality, that your instrument can be affected by your independent variable. Your genotype can't be affected, right? There's no ability for your environment to affect your genotype reverse causally. And second, that there's no way that your instrument can affect your dependent variable independently of the path through, um, through A, okay? C and B can only be correlated through A. So let me just give you an example from, from human data um, to, to set the stage. So um, many of you are in school right now. I mean, you're in graduate school, so this is a little bit of a different kind of thing. But there's a general question about whether being in school longer is good for you, right? Does it actually lead to higher income? It might or it might not because only certain people stay in school for a long period of time. And one of the really famous examples of an application of this is, do years of school actually causally affect income? Um, maybe. So the way they ask this is by looking at individuals who dropped out of school at age 16, all of the 16, age 16 dropouts. And it turns out that individuals who are born late in the year, if there's a hard cutoff for matriculation, and dropped out at age 16, were just in school longer than individuals who were born early in the year because they turned you know, <coughs> six after the start of um, that cutoff. And so by the time they hit age 16, they actually had almost like a year less school than individuals who started immediately after they turned six. So birth quarter becomes the instrumental variable. When were you born? Based on the argument that when you were born in the year couldn't possibly, arguably, affect income by itself, right? So it must be doing it through how long you're in school. And in fact, there's good evidence from some um, studies by economists that individuals who were born in the end of the year and therefore were in school longer before they dropped out actually do make more money. So stay in grad school as long as possible. <laughs> 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 All right. So in Mendelian randomization, you're, you're switching birth quarter in for genotype, right? And here's what we were going to ask. Does genotype that affects a gene expression show any sort of pattern that influence that suggests a effect on dominance rank? And our intermediate variable here, we use that PC2 of gene expression, which is strongly ranked correlated. Um, we showed a number of years ago that mapping genotype effects on gene expression, expression QTL, is pretty easy um, in the baboon population that we study. And so we did that for PC2 of gene expression. And here's a Manhattan plot showing SNP PC2 associations across the genome. Okay. We had to rule out the possibility that there was any direct genotype effect on dominance rank. I really think that all of these are probably false positives anyway, but just to be careful, we dropped out anything where there was a direct association at like P equals 0.05 or lower. And so we went from a possibility of using about 40,000 candidate um, SNPs to 16 instruments um, that satisfied our criteria. And we also believed that there was no other confounding by population structure or body mass or other kinds of things we could think of. Okay, so here's our prediction. Individuals with genotypes that predispose them to low PC2 gene expression, which is associated with high rank, should also tend to be high ranking. And we look at this across our 16 different instruments. And that's in fact exactly what we saw. 
So each of these dots is one of our instruments, and there's this strong positive correlation between the SNP-PC2 uh, association, so that's the genotype-gene expression correlation, and the genotype dominance rank correlation independent um, of any direct effects. And so, um, in case you're wondering, we don't see this at all in the rhesus macaques, thank God, because we were supposed to be doing this experimental method manipulation. And we can show that to you also by not using PC2, by, but by looking at every single um, uh, rank-associated gene independently, mapping SysEQTL in the baboons um, or in the macaques, and asking about the uh, distribution of, this is the distribution of p-values across all, the, all those genes for the Mendelian randomization test. We get strong enrichment of low p-values for the baboon males and absolutely nothing for the rhesus macaques, as we would expect if, in fact, we manipulated dominance rank as, as, um, as I told you we did. Okay, so what the heck is going on here? Um, we think that what this really highlights is that social status is not monolithic. It varies in meaning and it varies in the way it is attained between species and sometimes within species between sexes. So female rhesus macaques live in these very stable dominance hierarchies that are, um, in a natural setting, largely predicted by who, you, who your mom was. Male baboons live in highly, uh, highly uh, volatile, dynamic social status hierarchies where who's on top at a particular time depends on your ability to win fights like this. Okay? And so the sort of associations that we may see might be quite different. In particular, increasing um, the uh, baseline expression of inflammatory genes for males, we often think about chronic inflammation or things that look like chronic inflammation is costly, might in fact be something that's useful to do if in fact you're going to get in fights like this, right? Inflammation is there for a reason. It evolved in our immune systems to deal with uh, things like wounding. Um, and in fact, um, you know, that's an open hypothesis. But we do know that in baboon males, in the same population, that individuals who are high ranking actually heal from wounds faster than individuals that are low ranking, suggesting, you know, with some sort of independent evidence that there may be differences in how their immune systems work uh, that help determine who might be high ranking at a particular period in time. So I will wrap up with that, which is just to say social, social relationships are complicated and we need to think very carefully about what they mean for the animals that we're studying. Uh, and thank a, a bunch of people, um, a lot of people who work on the baboons, both on the uh, state side and in Kenya, a lot of people who work on the macaques, and uh, my lab, a lot of the work that I told you about today was led by Noah, and that should be both his two, and Amanda, who are my first uh, postdoc and graduate student, respectively. So, thanks for that. Thank you. On the YouTube channel, the MVZ YouTube channel, okay. yeah, it'll take about two weeks to go up. Okay. What specific slides? I'm happy to, to send some to you if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I wonder if uh, you, uh, you're uh, running across the relevance of this to uh, the psychiatric literature. So I'm a psychiatrist, and uh, there's a, a lot of um, uh, new thinking about uh, the. Uh, relationship between depression and uh, uh, adverse, uh, obviously social adversity, but also mediated through inflammation. Uh -huh. So there's the idea that that uh, at least some cases of depression have to do with your, if there's a, uh, a, uh, a, a response to adversity at the genomic level, uh -huh. and that it may relate to things like uh, uh, tuning the, the immune system to uh, being an outcast, to be more likely to be wounded. Right. And that's running in the psychiatric literature now. So, but your yeah. work it seems to be a great parallel to that. So. Yeah, so, so the, the, um, I talked to a really broad set of audiences, and, and psychiatry and psychology are, are you know, among the people that I, that I interface with. Um, I think, uh, yeah, there's some really interesting data sets that I think on the face of it corroborate what we see more closely with the female macaques than they do with what we're seeing in the baboons. Um, uh, as they aggregate, I think we'll be able to figure out 
at a finer grained level what kinds of experiences matter, whether those immune changes are, again, predecessors to the behavioral changes that you're talking about or, or vice versa. There's clearly a lot of evidence for a brain immune crosstalk. We don't really work on that, but, um, but I think the evidence is getting quite strong. Um, I would say that there is some stuff in that literature that kind of uh, provides an evolutionary uh, sort of hand-waving explanations um, at the end, and those are actually really interesting pieces for us to pull in as evolutionary biologists and think about whether there's a way to test them. This idea that low-ranking individuals are sort of anticipatory of damage, I'm pretty skeptical of, but I love when other people suggest hypotheses because, you know, they get something for our folks into. Yeah. Yes. So, just uh, a really fascinating talk, really interesting. And I know there was a reason I really liked hugging. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the, uh, I wonder if stress uh, has an effect on the way in which some of these genes that are being expressed yeah. are, in fact, expressed. And yep. you can use antioxidants as a means oh, of uh -huh. regulating stress levels while you're, you know, expressing these genes. Yeah, I haven't really thought much about antioxidants. Um, certainly, there's a there's a big elephant in the room question about like I'm a circulating immune cell, right? I'm a natural killer cell. I'm a monocyte. Well, how does a monocyte in the peripheral immune system know that it's in an organism who has recently been harassed, yeah. right? There, there's got to be something that connects with the external world, and I mean, naturally, we would think about aspects of um, the nervous system, about right. your brain, and. Um, downstream signaling of that. And so I think people have thought a lot about, like, like this literature is often embedded in a conversation about chronic social stress, chronic psychosocial stress for, for some literatures. And so the, the sort of um, mediating systems that are brought up most often are HPA axis, right, this is glucoc downstream of glucocorticoid, cortisol signaling, and two, beta adrenergic signaling. So this is, you know, downstream of, of, of that kind of sympathetic nervous system signaling. And there's a little bit of it, there's, there's some more evidence in rodent models of social stress um, that chronic dosage with beta blockers um, can reverse or ameliorate some of this sort of stuff. I haven't seen a lot of evidence for that in non-human primate systems, but it's an interesting, interesting possibility. Yeah. Michael. The LPS challenges in the wild baboons is yeah. great, um, but what do you know about infection, and natural infections in those animals, bacterial or viral infections, and how that relates yeah. to, to a social rank? We don't know, we definitely don't know anything about how it relates to dominance rank. We have just pieces of information from various types of studies and various types of data sets over the years. Um, that tell us some of the things that they carry. They don't carry SIV. They all are infected by herpes virus. Um, we did an analysis of microbiome data um, a number of years ago that suggests that social affiliation mediated by grooming does potentially transfer microbial communities from one baboon to the other, but whether that's good or bad is very hard to interpret. Um, so I think we don't have the data that would answer, I think, the question that you're asking, which is like, well, so if this is the case, then, uh, then what does that mean for their actual susceptibility to infection? Do, do dominant animals get less sick? Yeah, we don't know. What we know is that <coughs> female baboons, the biggest social predictor of lifespan in female baboons is, is our measures of social integration, actually, a measure of social bonds, and less so social status. But social status does determine social bonding to males, female-male relationships, and that in turn predicts lifespan. So there may be some social status effects on lifespan um, that we've analyzed mostly on the behavioral uh, side of things. Um, there is a very, very early stage analysis, which may not be, I'm just gonna tell the camera right now, we don't know if this is going <laughs> um, And it's being led by my uh, collaborator, Susan, which suggests that male baboons who are um, higher ranking than expected for age, because there's a strong age signature of who's higher ranking, actually may experience higher mortality risk, which would be consistent, I think, with some of what we're seeing here, if in fact high rates of chronic inflammation are damaging, but we don't know yet whether that, that is a, a solid result. So, yeah. But that doesn't tell us what, what it is that they're getting, right? Right. Um, that's really hard in a natural population. I often get asked questions about cause of death, and 
leopard? I mean, <laughs> so, yeah. Yes? Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, are you in a position to make clear statements, or relatively clear statements, about the... Clear or true? Some of your primate, your primate studies versus human, and where it does not work, the path in looking for the uh, physiological and genetic pathways as you're doing here, we it's easy as a member of the audience say, oh, that's so true. These damn male human males and those damn uh, baboon males, you know that I, I make these connections in my my head watching you speak yeah. there. I'm asking for some generalizations on what clearly do not fit that those. Seven million years of separation, whatever that is, uh, have counted for something. High, two highly social species, both primates, and we can see all of this. Can you? Do you have any suggestions? Humans really are doing something different, or they cut. They've cut out this aspect of uh, being so concerned about, you know, some aspect of uh, the social environment, <coughs> or included new things. Do you, do you get my question here? I think so. Um, okay. So from a, from a mechanistic perspective, I don't think I'm in a position to answer that question. What I think I would say is that most of the studies of social gradients in humans, whether the outcome is lifespan or whether it's some sort of um, um, uh, uh, aspect of physiological function or some sort of biomarker, have focused on societies where measures of social status are, um, are not determined by direct physical competition or, um, or, or, or physical condition. Right, which is, I think, what's going on, and which is clearly what's going on in the male bad visions. And so, when we talk about social status, I think that it's in the sorts of human populations that have been studied. There are cases in humans where physical condition is a is a major predictor of social status. It's just not what has been focused on. Um, we need to be very careful about which parallels we're drawing because the actual status hierarchy itself and how it's determined matters. Like that's that's a big thing that we took away um, from from the baboon case. The other thing I'll say though, yeah, I mean like so humans and baboons like 23 million years diverged or so ish. Um, that picture that I showed you of the phylogeny early on that was actually for social um, support social integration studies. We can plot a very similar one. In fact, we have done for measures of social status and survival. And those are social mammals that encompass tens of millions of years of independent evolution. And based on what we know about um, uh, obligate sociality, represent at least seven independent transitions to social group living. And there's still this very consistent relationship between um, the nature of these social relationships and survival outcomes. So I guess that leads me to there will be some very useful generalizations yeah. about, about sociality as such. Push things a particular direction and it doesn't, uh, the phylogenetic relationships are not, uh, may not be so absolutely critical. Right, yes. I mean, for me, the big takeaway from that is, is that if you are an obligately social mammal, your social relationships matter a lot, even if your social, the, the, the tendency to live in a social group has, in, has arisen independently. So, yeah, that's not about differences, which is what you asked about, but those are harder. Yeah. All right, let's thank Jenny again for a great talk.